what does information security look like in 2021? And given what we're seeing in the world today, all the craziness going on, is information security essentially equivalent today with security in general, in all senses of the word, period? Welcome to Tech First with John Kutsir. So I want to have a pretty wide-ranging chat today. It's a pretty crazy moment in world history. Lots going on. Cybersecurity is really in the very middle of it. We've seen lots of election questions lately in the U.S. We've seen over, over the past few years huge hacks exposing hundreds of millions of people. And we've just seen potentially evidence of perhaps the biggest hack in history, solar winds and supernova which exposed much of the United States government potentially. So how important is information security in 2021? What are the key challenges we'll face? And we're going to chat about all these different things. To chat through them, we're joined by Rinky Sethi, who's a Chief Information Security Officer at Twitter, and Frank Sargent, who leads Security, Risk, and Compliance at Infotech Research Group. Welcome, Rinky and Frank. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Hey, such a pleasure to have both of you, uh, especially you, Frank. It's a holiday for you, and it's a holiday for me as well. We're in Canada. Rinky, I'm assuming you're in San Francisco. That's right. I'm in the Bay Area. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. I think we need to start here, Rinky, with you. What is a CISO? What is a Chief Information Security Officer? What does a normal day look like for you? I don't know that I've seen a normal day <laughs> for uh, the last, gosh, decade. Um, so, you know, I, to me, a chief information security officer is really somebody who helps represent the best interest of a company as it relates to protecting data, protecting the company's assets um, and driving accountability around security risk. Uh, when you talk to me about my day to day, it varies. Some days are just one-on-ones with people on my team and making sure that I'm helping develop careers. Other days, I'm the woman in high heels. Uh, well, today, I guess the woman in little fuzzy slippers at home uh, working and driving security incidents and working closely with the team and ensuring that we're uh, containing security incidents that we might see on platform. Um, other days, it's working strategically with different partners across Twitter to ensure that we've got um, good thought leadership and how we're building security into the product and just different parts of the business. So every day is a little bit different, which is what makes the role exciting. At the end of the day, I'm here to help protect the business uh, at Twitter. And I'm guessing the less exciting a day is, the better the day is for you, uh, most likely. Um, and I'm guessing everything has changed for you over the past year, just like all the rest of us working in different places, not necessarily in offices. You've got a long history in cybersecurity, um, a decade at least. Um, Why did you take the role at Twitter? Uh, it's a pretty tempting target, one would think. It is. And I um, interviewed at Twitter at a very interesting time right before the election when Twitter was in the spotlight, I would say. And actually, that's what drew me to Twitter uh, was just their mission around protecting the pu public conversation. And it's such an inter uh, it was such an important time and it still continues to be uh, around making sure that the public is getting the right information, the information that they want, um, they need and that it's accurate. And so uh, Twitter's mission of public protecting the public conversation is exactly where I wanted to be, was to defend that. Um, and some of the choices they had made, how they were leading best practices in this space, um, I thought were very core and aligned to my values. And um, I, I couldn't think of a better challenge to go and take on. So that's why I chose Twitter. That's a good segue. And I know that you're not going to speak uh, specifically today to your role at Twitter and what you're going to do there. And you're just pretty new in the role as well. So you got a lot to explore and go on. But if you look at the, uh, the year ahead, perhaps 2021, and you think about the key challenges that we're going to face in cybersecurity, what comes to mind? Yeah, I think one is what I just shared, um, especially platforms like Twitter, we're going to have to focus on how do you protect the public conversation and ensure that cybersecurity doesn't become a disruptor or interruption to that. Um, we saw that happen earlier in the year with, uh, what, you know, with the breach at Twitter. And so I think we can't see things like that. And so I think that's going to be a continued target. Um, we're going to continue to see is a protection of the public con conversation. Um, the other is, I think, just 
folks are getting settled into this remote uh, working remotely. Uh, and I think companies are still focusing on how do you continue to make sure that the remote workforce is protected in the right way. And, you know, you're no longer uh, protecting just your own perimeter, but you're protecting, protecting home perimeters and trying to teach your employees on security hygiene, where you don't have the visibility that uh, you used to from a central security perspective. So I think that's going to be a continued area of uh, focus as well. Um, and companies are going to, I think, also are not are going to, but are starting to already migrate to the cloud. And, you know, um, I think that's going to be a big thing we see is a continued shift and focus on cloud security. Uh, so I think those are the three big areas I see. What a huge challenge, right? I mean, uh, Frank, it's been a long time since um, an enterprise has been just a building or a series of buildings to protect a perimeter from. But now, I mean, the the the, the membrane is 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 so diverse. There is no membrane, right? We're we're in a thousand different locations, especially a big company the size of Twitter, big enterprise with tens of thousands of 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 employees in tens of thousands of locations with potentially thousands of different configurations of technology and everything else. Uh, it's a challenging 2021 going forward, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. When you start to consider all of this new normal that we've been forced into in the last year, um, and start to bring in some of those concepts of zero trust networking and so forth of where is that perimeter? Where does it even exist at all in any way, <laughs> right? Used to be a real old school. You're behind the firewall and you're protected. But now, uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's gone by the uh, the sideway, and you know, it's a it's a whole new reality now of defining that perimeter, defining those risks, understanding what that looks like to an organization. Yeah, I wanna I wanna bring this a little bit general here because we we know that <clears throat> we have this phrase "software is eating the world," right? And, and I, I'm, I'm looking at information security, and I'm thinking that's becoming more and more equivalent to security in general. I mean, for companies and for nations, and the lack of it, or even perceived lack of it in case of the recent U.S. elections, has real implications for physical security and physical data, physical well-being, as well as uh, well-being of your data and everything like that. Talk a little bit about how that evolution has happened for the survival of companies and even nations. Well, you know, to, to, to kind of, you know, get on that whole thought of, of, you know, security and information security kind of merging. When you see how everything has evolved over the last uh, several years, you know, you think about 5G and its enablement of the Internet of Things. But now you're starting to see the merge of Internet or uh, IT and OT, operational technologies, as well as ICS, industrial control systems and these sort of things all coming together under one governance, one standard, uh, one way to look after things. Um, you know, it used to be that there was air gap situations where, you know, the, the security was such that we want to keep this gap in this place. Well, that gap doesn't actually exist anymore. If there's a wire, if there's a port open, you know, <laughs> there's an attack vector there, right? And we're bringing all this stuff together. And what those OT and ICS environments were protecting and doing, if you, you know, in the in the news in the last several years of, of looking after water quality, you know, even holding back water from dams and other uh, infrastructures, uh, you know, our power infrastructure, any of these types of, of situations, even if you get into medical devices. So when you think about your own personal safety, you know, when you think of all the different systems that are here to, you know, look after you, <laughs> provide that water, provide that heat, provide that food, um, you know, all of those systems are all managed now by all of the, the, the multitude of connected devices that are now at risk. Um, you know, you need to have that type of a, of a security program to, to manage into that sort of thing. So, you know, physical sa safety has been drawn right in, you know, kicking and screaming in a certain sort of way. Uh, and now these types of uh, security program measures are now getting implemented in there. Uh, and they're struggling to, to catch up, uh, certainly are. And we see that um, internationally as well, right? I mean, um, and I will get into this a little bit with Rinky in a bit, but Frank, I'm going to stick with you for just a second. We've seen solar winds, right? We've seen that massive hack. We really don't know how bad it is yet. We really don't know how 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 deep that went, how much people got from that, who exactly was responsible. Looks like Russia. I'm not sure that's 100 yeah. percent guaranteed or not, you know, but there's been multiple others as well. I mean, you know, what are your thoughts when you see something like solar winds and supernova, which was just discovered just recently? 
uh, it's certainly a wake up call. You know, you think about it almost as a single point of failure. You know, if you think about the, the US government and how many different departments and organizations have been affected by this. Um, it, it doesn't just happen in the U.S. as well. I think uh, new, yesterday in the news, I think it was, was uh, uh, the government of Vietnam has been impacted and it could potentially be that. And you don't even know what, you know, we could characterize this as, right? Solar winds was just the door. <laughs> you know, there's just all sorts of other avenues that they, this kind of breach and this kind of, uh, of attack could manifest itself as, right? And so, you know, we really still, you know, like you were just saying, we, we don't know what is really to come yet of this. There's been major outages from other uh, large vendors where, you know, is there speculation? Was that solar winds, right? And it, it's certainly that wake up call. Uh, you know, I, as I talk to many of our members, uh, it's, it's about understanding risk. You know, are we, are we going to be able to actually uh, stop this? You know, can I vet every single mem uh, uh, vendor that I deal with, you know, to, to the level that needs to be to protect my organization? Uh, you know, we've got to start to understand and use this as that wake up call to understand risk, you know, flex and, and, and mature our incident response uh, capabilities, that sort of thing. You know, just from a high level, it, uh, you know, I'm still very interested to see. I've seen a lot of the technical tidbits, um, you know, talk to even some of our uh, defense contractors and others that are really, really interested in what is going on, what those impacts are. And uh, it's still going to, uh, you know, the, the story is still playing out here most certainly. Rinky, it's got to make you think about what vendors you work with, right? And again, speaking in general, what vendors you choose to work with, how you evaluate them, how you evaluate their technology, how you evaluate SDKs you might put in your app, other things like that. That's got to make you pretty scared about working with a, a vendor. Am I wrong? Um, you know, I think you've got to have a good third party uh, risk assessment program at your company. And, you know, things like this happen. Um, I think that it's, um, you, you know, one of the things that companies have to look at what kind of data you're sharing with those companies. I think, in my opinion, when things like this happen, it's more, how are you going to react? And are you ready? And do you have the information right away to go and respond to this and contain it quickly and follow up with those relationships and those companies that, uh, with with those companies that, uh, you know, you have close relationships with because a security incident can happen. Um, it is it is getting scary. And I, uh, you know, again, I think that it's really important to be prepared um, because, it's any company can be affected by something like this. That's a good segue. Let's talk a little bit about you personally. You're a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. And, you know, we're often told things like there's no such thing as a fully secure system, which means that a system, if that's true, and I'm going to ask you that question as well, but if that's true, that means that there's a hole or there's 10 holes that any CISO doesn't yet know about that are there, right? I mean, A, how do you live with that? And 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 B, what are the implications of that in terms of how you do your job? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two aspects to this, right? You, many times I think in security, security is always playing catch up. <laughs> and so you're behind, you know, uh, it's rare that you're, you're in front of the problem and you're designing right from the beginning. And if you're not, then you're constantly paying catch up, even in the security industry. It's like, take cloud as an example, the cloud industry boomed, everyone started adopting AWS and GCP and Azure, even they didn't build in the right security controls. And a lot of the security vendors popped up because we needed to build the right security because technology uh, and innovation was being adopted so quickly. And so I think there's two aspects to it. You do have to work and play the catch up and make sure you're preventing security issues as these new technologies are evolving and building that security platform in. On the flip side, I think you also have to be prepared to detect and contain incidents for when they happen. You have to have a good way to get visibility um, so that you know, let's say there's a new technology or, you know, uh, your company is developing something new that you have a way of catching that um, and hopefully a chance to monitor that and be able to detect oh, something new popped up. We're going to go take a look, even if it's, uh, you know, it, it happens later uh, in the design cycle. Frank, I want to ping in with you on that one re real brief, because there are um, vendors that are building technology uh, using AI to just look for anomalies, look for things that are unusual, look for things that might be a hack. And we know that the U.S. government, for instance, invested billions of dollars in Einstein, right? Some technology to hopefully stop everything, anything like solar winds from ever happening. Uh, do you see 
is, is that path fruitful? Um, and, and what do you see as the, the best options there? Uh, certainly is fruitful. When you think about, uh, you know, organizations and their security budgets, if you will, you know, AI is certainly enabling far more visibility uh, with less staff, with less, uh, you know, uh, bodies in front of screens, so to speak, right? So there is that uh, that angle to it of creating that automation and so forth and that ability to, to see things and see things uh, far quicker and so forth. Um, you know, some of the downside, I guess, is if you don't know how long solar winds and any kind of hack has been in your environment, it's looking for, as you were saying, deltas and so forth. That looks normal, right? That's not normal. normal. Yeah, I well, wouldn't see that. Normally, he's already there. You know, the attacker's already in your environment. So, hey, it still looks good. Um, you know, so, you know, there, there is that whole seeding. There's that whole, uh, that AI learning of what is normal. What is the standard, even as organizations are trying to, to, to restore if they've had Orion in their environment of what is a good restoration point? How do I get back to a known good? What is that, right? And then, you know, <laughs> where is that going to land, right? So that AI's got that bit of a thought there that, you know, it's just looking at what it can see right now in a certain sort of way. But it certainly has a lot of good, uh, you know, upside uh, in a lot of different ways for a lot of different organizations that are handcuffed in certain sort of ways of hiring and having the, the skill sets around and so forth. So it, it, it really does in, in from many perspectives, but then there's some, some of the limitations as well that you need to understand. Rinky, when we think about information security, we, we, at least I do, maybe it's just me, uh, gravitate to code, to technology, to devices. Often security fails in social engineering attacks, right? In ways that people make a phone call, <laughs> get some information from Facebook and, 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 and worm their way into an organization somehow. How do you protect, how do you protect from that? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, technology has a play here and there's a lot technology can do to prevent social engineering attacks. It's companies are behind in adopting that. And so I think that's really important. Uh, things like YubiKey or, you know, um, any types of second, third plus plus factors you can put in place that make it really difficult uh, for attackers to get in, um, even if they're starting to see success in a so social engineering attack is important. Um, I also think, you know, um, it, continuing to educate your employees is super important. Um, and, you know, the more that you can do it in the moment, you know, I like to say that training is interesting that a lot of times we have these check the box annual security trainings that everybody does to meet some kind of compliance requirement. And it absolutely people take it. They don't even listen to it. They check yeah. the box and they move on. That is not what I consider security education. I think vendors are getting more savvy on how can you train users in the moment that they're doing something that maybe they shouldn't be. I think that's the most impactful kind of training. Um, one example of that is when someone maybe is putting something into a public shared folder that's accessible to the world that they get a flag saying, hey, did you mean to do that? Because what, what you just did is going to make it uh, whatever file you're sharing accessible to the whole world. Maybe you want to go back and change the settings on this. And the more that we can push training in the moment, I think as users are doing uh, you know, something that either intentionally or un unintentionally is bad. That's how folks are going to get trained. And I think it's really important to focus on training that's changing actual user behavior and you have, have data to measure that that's happening. So I think continuing to do user education is going to be a more critical even as folks are at home. And then, you know, I think they can take those tips to their kids and their significant others um, as they learn them to make sure that they're securing beyond just the workplace. I almost think I need to do two-factor authorization. Um, you know, if I get an email from somebody, message message them on Slack, and, and did you actually send that? You know, if it's something dangerous or challenging, Frank, I want to turn back to you. And it, we're in this crazy, complex reality right here. Right, um, ten days ago, uh, a month ago, we thought everything was fine. Um, all of a sudden, we find out that the U.S. government, the DoD. Um, all to, every every component of the U.S. military was potentially compromised. Well, we were all happily, you know, you, you had Thanksgiving, we had Christmas, we had, all, you know, all this was going on. So we're in this crazy complex reality where there's hacking from nation states, there's hacking from criminals, there's hacking just for fun and just to see what I can do, and there's hacking for profit. You know, this is a really challenging reality to be in. What, what are the stakes here, and how do we win this? <laughs> 
Well, the, the stakes, like we were just, you know, we were alluding to and we mentioned earlier, right? Like there's huge stakes here. Um, you know, when we talk about the, 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 the critical infrastructure that, you know, uh, many of the departments are trying to protect, you know, the, 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 the weapon systems, you name it, like, you know, it, it could have just ridiculous ramifications on all of us. So, you know, the stakes are quite high when you consider what is, uh, you know, what is going on at a nation state level. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, it's a, it's kind of a, like, you know, a scary, scary type of a situation when you get right down into what some of this stuff, what could actually happen here. Um, yeah, you know, when you say, could we win? <laughs> uh, uh, that's an interesting uh, kind of a concept, I guess. I, I don't know that there's a win. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I guess we'd have to define what winning is, and that's just, you know, keeping afloat, right? <laughs> a certain sort of way, right? And that, you know, the, the, you know, good is not going to defeat evil here in a way, and that, you know, we're getting more and more and more complex, and we've got to uh, learn and understand and prioritize what these threats and risks are. We really got to get our arms around what this stuff looks like and what we can do something about, what we can do with our limited budgets, our limited staffing, our limited, so many limited things in security <laughs> that uh, CISOs have got to fight upstream about and still try to provide that. So we've got to prioritize. We've got to understand what makes the most sense. What can we actually do something about? Not worry about the things that we can't, period. But, you know, kind of define winning by, you know, keeping up with that sort of thing, I guess, is, a, is the best way I could put it. Excellent. Rinky, I want to turn back to you. Um, Tech First is a podcast about people who are shaping the future, uh, technology that's changing the world. We see cybersecurity. And um, frankly, most of the time when you do your job, nobody knows. <laughs> when you are successful, nothing happens. Um, this is a challenging job to be in because it's only when you fail or somebody in your organization fails or some technology that you rely on in some way, shape or form fails, uh, all of a sudden you get thrust into the limelight. How um, how do you do your work in that way? And how will your work in information security shape the future? Um, I, you know, it, it's funny that you say that. I always used to use this uh, analogy that security is a back office job, uh, you know, and nobody knows. But I think things are changing. Security is in the news every day. And I think it's really important. And the CISO's role has morphed and changed too, that not only are, you know, you used to see two camps of CISOs, one that were really technical, more like architects, and then another that was very business savvy, really good at communications. And I think those are merging together. And it's really important for CISOs to communicate really well across their different stakeholders and partners in a company such that it's not that back office job and it's in the forefront on a day to day basis. And that everybody understands that it's not just the CISO's job to carry the weight and the stress yeah. and of security on their shoulders, but it's a shared responsibility for everybody in the company. And that top down championship is super critical to be successful at security. So I think that it, you can't just wait for a security incident, then security's in the spotlight, then something's not right. And that I see as a major part of my job is to make sure security's being thought of uh, every day, everything and every decision that's being made uh, by folks in the company. And so that it doesn't stay as that back office job. And that's how I, that, that's what I hope to accomplish uh, here at Twitter and in any future CISO role that I take on. Frank, let's turn to you. Same sort of question. Basically, you are in. You're an analyst. Um, you're you're a consultant. You advise people on technology. You advise them on. You write reports, other things like that. What are you hoping to achieve? As part of which now? <laughs> <laughs> Your personal mission in life. <laughs> My personal mission in life. Well, uh, you know, for for being in security, I, I you know I've kind of hinted at it over and all. It's just understanding risk, whether it's personally, you know, with some of these things, worry about what you can and do something about those things that you can and not worry about the things that you can't, but still acknowledge them, right? Like, and I sit and talk uh, for, for many uh, years now with uh, a lot of our InfoTech members in, in trying to get their arms around that risk, understanding what risk is. Uh, you know, it's great to be able to have all these technologies and so forth. But again, you're still in this limited kind of a of ability to, to, to look after things. And, you know, you got to be able to prioritize. So it's it's talking about that, prioritizing what you can do, prioritizing the risk, understanding what the, all of those different uh, threats are. 
and, and trying to get that out to everyone. You know, we're doing a lot of different research in that space at InfoTech right now. I'm trying to get that out, uh, you know, that message out a few different ways. And, uh, you know, it's certainly the, the the thing I'm taking out of solar winds and a lot of what goes on this year, the move to the cloud and all that is, is really getting uh, organizations and individuals arms around, you know, uh, risk and the understanding of this new way of do this new order, this new world, so to speak. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rinky. Thank you so much, Frank. Really do appreciate your time. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you so much. For everybody else, thank you for joining us on Tech First. My name is John Kutsir. I appreciate you being along for the show. You'll be able to get a full transcript of this in about a week at johnkutsir.com. And the story will come up at Forbes shortly thereafter. Full video is available on my YouTube channel. Thank you for joining. Until next time, this is John Kutsir with Tech First.